This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. Hi, welcome to a new edition of Behind the Headlines. I'm Charlie Greenewalt, Senior Fellow of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. I'm joined as usual by my co-host, Mara Donnelly. Welcome, Mara. Hello, Charlie. Uh, how was your, uh, how's the new year treating you so far? So far, so good. No complaints. Anything that strikes you as being unusual on the Hill so far this year? <laughs> no, nothing new that's unusual. <laughs> well, it seems like some of the sexual harassment yeah. uh, charges are following from Washington right. to Harrisburg, yes. and uh, yeah. there's all kinds of interesting things uh, happening. Uh, sad. Yeah, it's yes, very sad. It, it, yeah. Absolutely, it certainly is, but uh, needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Uh, today we have with us someone to talk about uh, health. This is a good subject in the new year. Yes. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Scott Bishop back with us. Scott, you are the vice president, the senior vice president for legislative advocacy for the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hi. Why? We, we're so thankful that you're here because uh, the state budget is being put together right now and we're wondering what you and the association are looking for in this new year's budget, Scott. Well, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, that's an important part of the work that we do on behalf of hospitals and the patients that they uh, care for. Uh, the state budget, um, Pennsylvania doesn't have a public health system, you know, public hospitals, so uh, the way patients are cared for, it's a partnership between the Commonwealth and, and hospitals, and a large part of that is the funding that we receive. Um, through Medicaid and then also specially kinds of funding for the programs like our small critical access hospitals, uh, programs for uh, uh, neonatal care, things like that. And so these are all lines that are funded by the state budget. And so as that uh, work gets up and running, it'll be a, a key point of uh, focus for us. Mm -hmm. what, what, what might happen if if you get less funding or don't get any, I can't imagine you won't get any, but yeah. let's, let's say you, you take it, it takes a dip. Sure. So we're fortunate over the last couple of years, uh, we've worked well with the governor and the legislature to make sure that that hasn't happened. Um, it's, always a, it's always a risk, as we all know, that you know, the state revenues, the economy, things like that, uh, throw uh, you know, challenges to the legislature, to the governor. But uh, we're hopeful that uh, this, this year's budget will, will reflect the kind of partnership that we need, and, and that's uh, ample funding for the, the programs that have been there for us. And again, we've been fortunate over the last uh, couple of years, even with some of the uh, tumultuous times uh, economically, the state budget has, uh, has you know, funded us in key, key places. And I understand there are three specific line I lines that you're looking at. Yeah, um, so each year, uh, kind of, th Couple different areas that are important to us. Your big picture Medicaid, that's a big complicated right. way in which we're funded. That nobody understands. Uh, <laughs> right, we do our best, but, uh, but then there are uh, kind of a couple of areas. First, uh, we have what are called critical access hospitals. These are our smallest hospitals in the most rural parts of the Commonwealth, and they get, they get uh, some special funding to make sure that they can keep their doors opening. So that's one place. Second place is uh, obstetrics and neonatal care. Again, those sometimes uh, there are some of our most vulnerable patients. Um, and so there's a, there's a line of funding for that. And then we also have a burn, uh, specialty care and trauma centers who, you know, obviously gunshot wounds, things like that, that require an intense level of care. Those are special areas in which uh, the legislature and the governor direct funds specifically, and so those are always priorities for us. Good. Well, recently, Scott, Governor Wolf declared uh, the opioid and the heroin crisis a disaster emergency for the Commonwealth. What does this mean for our hospitals here in Pennsylvania, Scott? Yeah, and we're grateful for the governor's leadership on that issue. Uh, the governor and the legislature have done, over the course of the last couple of years, you know, placing a real focus on this. And again, we're partners with, with state government. We're partners with local government uh, on, these, on these issues. So it's good to bring focus uh, that, the, uh, that the declaration is done. And we're going to continue to work with the governor, the legislature on the things that we can do. So that's, that's legislatively speaking, you know, things like prescription guidelines, things like that, that there's a government component. Uh, then there's things that hospitals do in partnership with their communities, like drug take back, um, making sure that uh, the, the right local uh, folks are in our hospitals and the emergency departments when someone does have an overdose, making sure that they have access to the to the resources that they have. So this is this is a crisis that requires all of us to be working in partnership. And again, we're we're not always on the same page with 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 state government on all the different aspects of it. But I think we, we do our best to try to be you know effective partners because um, after all, hospitals you know we're we're seeing uh, firsthand day to day uh, what families are going through. Uh, what what addicts are going through, uh, maybe more than anyone else. So it's uh, it's a it's a key issue for us, and I think uh, continue to work. And you know, we've got some ideas about 
even some additional things that we can do with behavioral health funding, things like that. So, well, it's very unusual for a governor to, to declare a disaster emergency mm -hmm. outside of you know floods and right. hurricanes and things like that. So, um, hopefully, this sort of coordination of all state resources on this issue will um, make a difference, and the hospitals will play a critical role in that. Yeah, yeah, I think so, and I think it draws attention to again one area: behavioral health. You know, people. Uh, are always drawn to physical health, you know, they, they think about uh, those things, but behavioral health, especially when it comes to uh, reasons for addiction, uh, uh, results of addiction, all those kinds of things, that's still a place where we could we could see additional funding and places for the Commonwealth to invest, because uh, after all, we, folks who are going through this, they need a place to go for the, the inpatient treatment that they need or the uh, counseling, all those kinds of things, and um, there's there's opportunity for, for increases in funding there that we'd like to try to work with the legislature and the governor on. Yeah. Hope it makes a difference. Yeah. It would be great. Well, how does the opioid crisis uh, affect the budget, Scott? Well, I think uh, I think um, there will be places where the governor seeks to, to invest. I think the legislature will seek to invest more as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's part of what they look at when it comes to health care and the funding that they need to do. Um, and so it's a it's, uh, it, it creates a kind of a new burden on uh, kind of the current infrastructure for sure, but then also trying to figure out ways in which uh, funding can be expanded to, to do the kinds of services that, that folks need. So uh, it's certainly a stressor because this is not a this is not a side issue. It's not a small kind of um, medical concern. This is this is a, a major crisis, and uh, it, it requires all the different kinds of things, which includes you know ample state funding. So I think it's a challenge. Um, I think it's a challenge for policymakers to figure out the best ways to invest those those resources. And we've talked before about the importance of telemedicine in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. because we are so rural. Yeah. And I imagine that'll take uh, play a big role in uh, addressing this opioid crisis. Yeah, telemedicine is a top priority for us mm -hmm. policy-wise. Uh, you know, and it and it's you're right, it's rural, but it's suburban, it's urban. Um, the ability to have technology be used at at its uh, maximum for patients is is incredibly important. And in one area, uh, telepsychiatry, for instance, um, the ability for folks to have access to specialists uh, via telemedicine, I think that's, uh, that's a great opportunity mm -hmm. because there are, there are not psychiatrists everywhere, especially uh, in rural parts of the state, but even, even uh, in urban and suburban as well. So having that access is, in, is uh, incredibly important. Well, Scott, one of the things that certainly caught the imagination of the press at this point in the year is the f subject of the flu. Yeah. <laughs> what you haven't had it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I went and I got my flu shot, uh, but I'm wondering how are the hospitals prepared for the flu? Um, when you uh, listen to some of the national press, it appears to be a uh, problem of biblical proportions. Yeah. In Pennsylvania, I think uh, I think we're very well prepared. and, and uh, one of the best examples of partnership uh, between hospitals and state and federal and local government is emergency preparedness. And the, the flu uh, uh, epi epidemic is no different uh, in that regard. And so our hospitals are prepared. Um, they've, they're dealing with the shortage, you know, things like IV. But um, it, when you go to the hospital, if, if there's not the IV, if they're not hanging a bag, there are other ways in which they're getting the medicine that you need. So. Um, each case is unique, different, uh, communities are different, uh, the ability of hospitals to deal with this is, is uh, different, but the, the key part of this is being prepared. Um, and our hospitals are, are doing that, they are prepared, and so you can be assured that when you're, you know, if, if you have a case that requires you to be hospitalized, that you're going to get the care that you need, the, um, the treatment that you need. It may not be, it may be an alternative form, maybe something different than just a simple hanging of a bag, but. Um, You'll you'll get what you need. So. Yeah, isn't that IV short IV bag shortage related to Puerto Rico? Is that true? Did, um, I, did I mishear that? But yeah, it's yeah. hard for me to say exactly where the yeah. where all the shortage comes from, other than you know that it's there. But it's an issue. It's an yeah. issue, and and so requires again it requires uh, hospitals to be prepared for that. But uh, said it's one of the great. Uh, you talked earlier about um, you know we think of emergency declarations, things like that, flooding storms yeah. and. But all these different kinds of things, hospitals are always working uh, as a part of emergency preparedness to be ready for these things. And, and the flu, uh, the IV shortage is just another example of that. Hopefully none of our viewers will need to 
go to the hospital because of the flu. I hope not. Yeah. I hope not. Um, going back to the heroin and the opioid crisis for a moment, Scott, I was wondering how the hospital community looked upon this. The health community generally around the United States has done a wonderful job in curbing cigarette usage. Uh, my family used to take vacations at Rehoboth Beach, for example, in the summertime, and it seemed like half the population was smoking. Uh, when one goes there now, uh, you can count the number of people you see smoking on one hand during the course of a week. The smoking has been cut, it reduced so much. Why can't we do, seem to do a better job against heroin and opioids? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Charlie, and I think we are, uh, we are trying to do more in that. And again, one example is working um, in partnership with government on things like uh, prescription guidelines, things like that, you know, trying to give a little bit more predictability, a little more structure to what's prescribed as it relates to pain medication and other ways to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's a transitional kind of thing. It's not something that's done overnight, but I think we can look at examples of hospitals who are making great inroads to try to, you know, throttle back those kinds of things, and uh, you know, it's just one step in 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 doing that. But it's uh, it takes a lot of different things. It's education. It's a lot of different uh, components to that to to make it go. To, you know, similar to where smoking seemed to be commonplace, whether it's TV, movies, mm -hmm. real life. Oh, absolutely. To to now where it, it's uh, it's less. And so I think I think we're we're in the middle of that process uh, to do those things. And again, I, I know I've said the word a couple times, but it, it's it is a true partnership between us. Uh, government, you know, communities, things like that, to, to try to get those, get that change. Can we win? I think so, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's going to take a lot of time and effort uh, and energy and focus, but uh, I certainly won't want to be the guy saying, no, this is a pointless gesture, right? This is something mm -hmm. we want to we think about, that we can overcome it and we can win it. That would be nice. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned uh, popular TV and movies that used to be smoking all the time and those sort of things that was yeah. taken for granted, and that's all disappeared. But right. uh, we want to thank you so much, Scott, for being with us today right. and look forward to having you back soon to see what's going on with the budget and the hospitals. So sure. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We'll be back with you, uh, the new segment, right after this. Stay tuned. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, helping hospitals provide healing, health, and hope to communities across the state. And by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. The Pennsylvania Chamber serves as the frontline advocate for business on Pennsylvania's Capitol Hill by influencing the legislative, regulatory, and judicial branches of state government. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Visit pahighwayinfo.org. Hi, welcome back to Behind the Headlines. On this uh, segment of Behind the Headlines, Maura and I are fortunate enough to be joined by Brad Bumstead, who is the Bureau Chief of the Caucus. Brad, um, could you tell us a little bit about the Caucus as we start this segment? Sure. It was launched in January 2017. It's a print-only publication owned by LNP Media Group uh, in Lancaster, and it's... it's uh, Bent is investigative reporting. It's focused almost solely on the state capitol. Uh, occasionally we'll stray from that, but not much. And we do, you know, deep dives into issues, and, and uh, it's not all gotcha journalism. It's, it's about, you know, peeling away layers uh, to try to look at what's really going on with things up on the Hill. Well, it's a coup for the caucus to uh, get you away after all those years with the Pittsburgh newspapers. Uh, uh, you are the uh, one of the veteran reporters and one of the most knowledgeable people about what's going on in Harrisburg. It's another way of are. saying I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not, no, no, it's not, Brad. No, it's not. Uh, well, Maura and I would like to ask you about this upcoming governor's race. It just seems like we had a race between the two Toms, and here we're it's shaping up for a new uh, gubernatorial contest. Mara, I, I can't believe it's so soon. Do you? It, it does. It has gone by fast, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Could you give us the lay of the land in this upcoming gubernatorial uh, election, Brad? Absolutely. It's, it's uh, the 
a lot of people think that Scott Wagner, who's a senator from York County, uh, may be the front runner and has a good shot at getting the Republican State Party endorsement. However, there's a certain school of thought that is, they, they may not endorse because they have so many folks out there, um, good candidates in Mike Terzai, the Speaker of the House, who you would normally think would be the, the inside candidate to get sure. the endorsement, uh, except that Wagner has been working this about a year and a half. Then you have Paul Mango, who's the uh, real conservative alternative in this primary. I mean, people are joking that he makes Mike Terzai look like a moderate. How can yeah. one be more conservative than Scott Wagner? Scott Wagner is a, is, isn't as conservative as you think. He's a populist. Mm -hmm. He, he okay. supports gay rights. He, he uh, uh, supports clean slate for you know, allowing people to get rid of their criminal records from years ago. He's not a, let's put it this way, he's not an ideologue, even though he is conservative. Okay. But uh, Paul Mango, tell us a little bit about him. Well, Paul is, is a um, West Point graduate uh, who, who uh, served in the Army, Army in Germany when he, when he got out of West Point and then worked for uh, McKinsey Company, which is a uh, worldwide consulting company, one that was actually employed by Governor Wolf when he came into office to try to, uh, you know, assess uh, the budget and the ways to save money. Um, I asked Paul Mango about that, and he said, I didn't, I didn't even know at the time that we were doing that report, and he left shortly thereafter that report came out. Mm -hmm. And his focus was almost totally on health care there. So he really is a health care expert, mm -hmm. and he apparently made a lot of money working for McKinsey Company over the years, and he says he has $5 million to put into this race. It wasn't the formal filing, but you know he put out the statement. Um, so he's uh, a power to contend with in this, in the sense that uh, Republican Party voters tend to be more conservative, and you know he's the conservative candidate. His, his ads on TV show him uh, you know, in the 82nd Airborne and, and paratroopers jumping out of planes, one of, one of whom supposedly would, would be him. It's not actually him jumping out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could have been him. It could have been yeah. him. Right? <laughs> and I guess when he we went to Harvard right after his Army commitment was up and got an MBA uh, at Harvard. He did. I mean, he's got great credentials for this. He had Army Ranger training, 82nd Airborne, you know, Harvard MBA, uh, health care uh, expert. He's got a lot going on. But he is very conservative, and, and uh, he, he's... As Wagner is to a certain extent, they, they are running against Wolf even in the primary. Everything mm -hmm. is about uh, Wolf. And at a recent press club event, Mango kept referring to the you know socialist socialistic uh, practices of Governor Wolf. You know, oh. so, um, so Mango is really the only one that could literally give Scott Wagner a run for his money because they both have they can be self-funded. They they could be, but we yeah. don't know that Laura Ellsworth couldn't be. Um, Let's and, talk about her, because you know, I, I hear very positive things yeah, about yeah, her. Yeah, there are a lot of positive things about her, yeah. but just on the money part of it, somebody who's been, you know, a founder of the Pittsburgh office of the largest law firm in the world, uh, Jones Day, mm -hmm. presumably has a good deal of money. She's now like a, uh, you know, a, some kind of, uh, she's not a partner or manager anymore, but she still has an affiliation with the firm, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Uh, but yeah, she she's, um, really stands out in the debate. Um, debates that have taken place, and not just because she's a woman, but her views are a little more moderate, perhaps, than the other three men who are in the race. And uh, it's refreshing, you know, to have that. So I've heard a lot of positive comments about her, too. Mm -hmm. What else can you tell us about Laura? I don't know a lot else about her. I haven't interviewed her yet. We're interviewing her this week. Uh, but um, uh, she just, I mean, look, this, this is a race that breaks down along several lines. One is uh, geography and another is gender. And, you know, if this goes like the, the court races, and I don't, I'm not sure that it will exactly, it's not the same, but, you know, one woman standing out with three men who aren't all that well known, maybe she wins. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's that possibility. Yeah. However, the problem for her and for Mike Terzai and, and for Mango is that all three are from Allegheny County. Uh -huh. They'll split that vote, which is really going to help uh, Wagner. Mm -hmm. hmm. Absolutely. So what's going on in the lieutenant governor race? Anything exciting? No, it's, it's um, where it stands now is there's a lineup of uh, people, you know, 
running against Lieutenant Governor Stack, who's had a troubled uh, past year or so, uh, particularly with Governor Wolf and, and uh, some scandal. And uh, again, could you remind the viewer was what the scandal? Yeah, was, it was that uh, Mike Stack and and his wife uh, were allegedly abusive to the, the mansion staff, the people who were cooking and cleaning for them, and to the state troopers who were driving them around. Uh, Governor Wolf became concerned about, you know, a hostile workplace for these people and stepped in and, you know, actually took the, the state police detail away from Stack, which is unprecedented. I've never right. heard of that. And um, uh, removed most of the mansion staff. I guess they left them with a groundskeeper or something, you know. Um, so uh, that, that's prompted some interest of all these other people to jump in, most prominent of which is, is the uh, mayor of Braddock, uh, John Fetterman, uh, who, who made a decent showing recently in the Senate race. Um, and Madeline Dean, who's, who's a very articulate um, uh, female member from uh, Montgomery County. Uh, however, uh, if you look at this race right now, Mike Stack is still the only person running out of the city of Philadelphia um, where there are some big numbers, okay? All these other people are from the suburbs and they're from, you know, other parts of the state and they all will divide up the anti-Stack vote. A lot of people think he'll, he'll be back in as lieutenant governor. Hmm. Not saying that's going to happen, but that's yeah. the theory. Okay. But we see a very interesting arrangement on the Republican side regarding the lieutenant gubernatorial race that the Moore is asking about. Here we have uh, Scott Wagner has already uh, tried to pair up with a candidate. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the Republican side of the lieutenant gubernatorial race? Yeah, th th this idea of pairing with a candidate, uh, you know, goes back a ways. You know, d different uh, gubernatorial candidates have tried to do it, and it doesn't always work out. I mean, there's no guarantee that Bartos is going to win uh, the primary. Because they don't run on a ticket. No, they don't run on a ticket, right. so he may wind up with somebody else he didn't choose. But, um, you know, Bartos is a, a wealthy Philadelphia businessman, and I imagine it helps Wagner with that Philadelphia tie, you know, to, to do that. Uh, you have legislators, um, uh, some other people running against them, but th these are really obscure races. I mean, even though it's for an important position, the number two position in state government, a heartbeat away from the governor. No one's heard of most of these people. Otto Voigt and yeah, um, yeah. Denlinger. Gordon Denlinger from yeah. Lancaster County. Right. These are, these are virtually unknown people, and, and that's often what happens is you get these all these unknowns. They're all thrown out there, and somebody like Stack is known in Philadelphia. He's a ward chairman there. So, The, the predictions are that Pennsylvania is going to lean D leaning D. Well, I, th I think that, that it's in an off-year election, that's that's a pretty fair prediction. Mm -hmm. it, it, historically, that's been the case, not just in congressional races, but that a lot of that filters over then to the governor's office and other things. But uh, I, I think that's probably true, that these will have some advantage uh, as a result of any blowback that there is there against Trump. Mm. Well, Brad, is the cycle dead? Uh, we had the cycle in Pennsylvania politics when, from the end of the Second World War up until the last gubernatorial election. You had eight years of Republican control, eight years of Democratic, eight years of Republican, eight years of Democratic control. Now, that's not surprising since the Constitution was changed in 68, 69 and allowed the governor to succeed himself. But before that, you needed two Democrats in a row, two Republicans in a row. And this cycle seemed to be uh, sort of an ironclad fact in Pennsylvania political life. It did. And that was blown away by Tom Wolf. I was. Uh, and is the cycle out the window now? Is it done? It remains to be seen. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, a lot of the analysts believe that Wolf's prospects for re-election are better than they were his first two years and they're, that they're better, you know, maybe better than 50 percent that, you know, good chance that he will be reelected. But there's no guarantee and he is vulnerable and he does have a potentially strong opponent in, in any one of these four people. Although I would say that, that Mango, while he has the best credentials to win the primary, might be too conservative for the general election, hmm. whereas Ellsworth might have the best credentials for the general election. So it's, it's anybody's ball game. <laughs> oh, it really is. <laughs> it really is. It is. And, yeah. and you know, it's going to um, be interesting. Somebody like Terzai, who, who's uh, going to be able to raise a good deal of money as House Speaker, uh, he's also running for his House seat, which is an interesting oh. thing. Oh. If he starts to make some headway, people will start banging on that. Yeah. 
Oh. Could you have a situation, Brad, where you have the Republicans just, uh, are, it's such a competitive race, race, and perhaps maybe you will turn into an acrimonious race, that they use up all their resources fighting one another, and then the, uh, vic the victor going up against Governor Wolf has, no re has few resources left. Yeah. Uh, is that, that scenario a, possible? Sure, that's possible, and that, you know, presumes that, that uh, uh, it's used up because the candidate who wins is somebody who the real money donors won't donate to or don't like. But I think it's entirely possible that um, they could split up the money and they'll, if it looks like a winner and a chance to beat Wolf, the money will come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So tell us, what other hot issues are you working on? I know you've covered some of the um, sexual harassment, unfortunately, in uh, Pennsylvania. And so what else are you, what else is the caucus looking at? Oh, that's one of the things that we're, we're looking at, at uh, continue to look at is, is uh, different cases that, that in, and instances that require investigation to be able to um, look at them and the policies that surround sexual harassment. Uh, you know, we came up with a story that showed that the Pennsylvania State Police had made $8 million in payouts over about 10 years for sexual harassment. Yeah, which made the House and Senate payouts, right. you know, <laughs> seem small very, by very minor. Yeah. Yes. Well, anything else you can give us a hint about? Uh, it's it's uh, a lot of things we have on the plate here. I can't really talk about. I'm okay. sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. You know I'm going to ask. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't blame you. In the last 30 seconds, what about the Senate race? Uh, how's that shaping up? Does Bob Casey have anything to be worried about? Uh, it's hard to say. At, at this point, I'm, I'm, the smart money would be on him being reelected just because of the gold brand name in Pennsylvania politics. And, you know, Bob Casey doesn't really do anything to offend people, mm -hmm. which is what it takes to, you know, throw somebody out of office. You have to be mad at them or whatever. Yeah. And he's um, a genial guy, and, and uh, regardless of his policies. Uh, the, the, Most people like him. Right, and yeah. there's no real reason to throw him out yet. <laughs> Maybe the Republican will come up with one. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Brad. Well, on that note, uh, we want to thank you so much for being with us again. And uh, please keep on digging and so you can come back and bring some more new stories for yes, our viewers. Which you can talk about. We, we'll do that. <laughs> okay. And we'll see you again next week on Behind the Headlines. See you then.